Hello, my name is Pablo Romero Fresco. I work at University of Vigo in Spain, where I lead the research group GALMA and where I conduct research on media accessibility. In this last video lecture for Module 1A, I'll be covering a new approach to media access training and practice. As has been mentioned throughout this module, there has been a number of interesting developments in media accessibility over the past years including Gianmaria Greco's three shifts in media access and what is known as accessible filmmaking. So let's start with the three shifts, first of all. According to Greco, media access has been shifting towards a universalist account that concerns not only persons with sensory disabilities, but all persons who cannot or cannot completely access audiovisual products in their original form. The second shift is the transition between a maker or expert-centered approach to a user-centered approach, where the users are regarded as the bearers of knowledge that is essential for the design of the product. Related to this, in order to have an impact on design, the third shift highlights the change from a reactive approach that deals with access once the product has been made to a proactive approach that is considered from inception or during the production phase. Accessible filmmaking may be seen as an example of how the, these three shifts are in a way implemented. Uh, accessible filmmaking may be defined as the consideration of translation and accessibility during the production of audiovisual media, which involves the collaboration between the creative team and the translator in order to provide access to content for people that cannot or cannot properly completely access in its original form. Um, now, accessible for making is universalist because it is intended for people who cannot or cannot properly or completely, as we said, access uh, the original audiovisual product in its original form. Um, but uh, we're not only talking about people with sensory disabilities, so it is universalist. It's also, it's also user-centered because there, there's a collaboration between the creative team and the translator that involves a discussion uh, and application of findings from reception research that can inform how translation and access are approached. That is, findings that, tells us, that tell us how the accessible and translated versions are received by the users. And finally, accessible filmmaking is proactive uh, because it is applied during the production of audiovisual media. More information on accessible filmmaking can be found um, in the Accessible Filmmaking book uh, by Routledge and in the guide that we have also prepared for mostly for filmmakers. Um, and this is information about research, training and professional practice, how it's done, where, when, uh, the use of a director of access and translation. All of this can be found in both the book and, and the guide. Both the shifts, uh, the, sh the three shifts in media access and accessible for making have led to a revision of the current way in which media access is taught and applied professionally. At the moment, the current approach, which works very efficiently, it's important to highlight that, um, is what we have in, in the first column in this table. Um, it's centered mostly on impairments, it's focused on compensating, that is making up for missing content, that is providing information to make up for loss of information. It takes the able expert as a reference. It's mostly concerned with comprehension. It's focused on one sense, the sense that it's missing, so to speak. It does have echoes of the medical model of disability, which we have seen already in this uh, module. It results in uh, professionals or students who are mostly technicians who apply guidelines and it is conducive to this separation between the production um, phase and the distribution phase where translation and access normally take place. The new approach that we are covering here would be different. It's centered on both disabilities and abilities. It's focused on facilitating the user's experience as opposed to making up for lost content the reference is the user. It's concerned with engagement as opposed to comprehension. 
It's focused on more than one sense. It has echoes of the social model of disability. It results not in technicians, but in more artistic and uh, collaborative approach. And it is conducive to the collaboration between filmmakers and translators. So in a way, it, it is conducive to accessible filmmaking, although it doesn't require accessible filmmaking. Apply to subtitling, and more specifically to subtitling for the deaf and hard of hearing. In the current model, the focus lies more on the fact that deaf viewers cannot hear than on the fact that they can see. Uh, subtitling for the deaf and hard of hearing, in terms of training, seems to lean more heavily on the analysis of dialogue and sound than on the analysis of images. On how deaf people read than on how deaf people see on reading speed than on viewing speed. And students tend to focus first of all on the dialogue and the sound, and only later on the information conveyed by the images, if they do that at all. In the following examples, it wouldn't be unusual for students to consider first of all what kind of description can accurately describe the music used in these shots. This leads to um, two subtitles, in this case, with two adjectives each that accurately convey what the music is like. However, if instead of focusing first of all on providing viewers with hearing loss with the information that they are missing, in this case the sound, if we take instead as a starting point the information that they have, that is the information that they can obtain through the images, and we focus therefore on their visual abilities rather than on their auditory impairment, then we may make different choices. We would need to consider, first of all, how much information is already being conveyed by the images. Um, is the character's dance already vivacious, for example, here? Is the meaning of frenzied or anguished already being com conveyed by the images? If so, we may decide to shorten the sound description in order to allow viewers to use their abilities and capture as much meaning from the images as possible, which becomes more difficult if they have to read a long subtitle. Similarly, if we are faced with fast dialogue and a subtitle at, for example, 18 characters per second on the next two shots, the new, um, let's just call it engagement-based and ability-driven approach will cause us to make a distinction between these two shots. The first shot is visually complex. It's a busy shot and requires viewers to explore the screen to see the different actors on stage. In order to allow viewers to see what they need to see, we may decide to, for example, edit down the subtitle, reduce its speed, and thus allow viewers to spend more time on the image. For the second shot, especially if the character has already been seen in that scene, the viewers don't need to explore the frame, but rather to focus on her, which means that we may decide not to edit down the subtitle. Even though some subtitling trainers may mention this in class, and a note about this can be found in some books or in Jocelyn Evers' thesis, for example. Most students, and probably some professionals, take the analysis of the dialogue and the sound as their starting point, instead of being led by the images when producing subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing. This focus on the absence of sound in the current model, rather than on images, means that trainees often become providers of information who fill in with words the audio gaps that the deaf viewers cannot hear. In the first two shots of Joining the Dots, uh, Trevor, the protagonist, can be heard but not seen. Now, the current approach to SDH um, and most guidelines, such as those by Netflix, for example, advise to use a label such as male voice, because using the label Trevor would give more information to the deaf viewers than what's available for hearing viewers. Again, hearing viewers are the reference to take decisions here on SDH. This is fine, but if we adopt an engagement-based approach and we focus not only on providing information, but also on facilitating a viewing experience, taking not the hearing viewer, but the viewer with hearing loss as a reference, then we may decide differently. Male voice as a label can convey part of what the hearing viewer gets, but only part of it. Uh, because most hearing viewers also know that the voice is quite hoarse uh, from someone who's a native English speaker, who is quite old, etc. But anyway, even though it can convey part of what the hearing viewer gets, um, it can also cause confusion in the viewer's experience. Um, once the viewers with hearing loss see Trevor in the next shot, 
they may wonder if the previous male voice belongs to him or to, say, another blind person whose words may have been used to open the film with. Putting ourselves in the shoes of a person with hearing loss watching the film, we may prefer, for example, to give away Trevor's name in the first shot, if that helps to create a more seamless visual experience in the opening of the film. The current training model does not ask students to take, as we said before, responsibility for the um, for their artistic contribution. Our job may have been relegated to the distribution process, away from the creative, t creative team, but our subtitles are still going to be a crucial part of the artistic product. Our subtitles are part of a film's language, and our decisions may affect not only how the subtitles are received, but also how the film is received. In the following scene, we may choose to describe the sound made by the alien as gut guttural croaking. If the next time the alien appears it makes a different sound, we may choose a different description. However, an approach that encourages students to take responsibility for their artistic contribution to the film and to consider their impact on film language may lead to a subtitler, for example, to describe the second and different sound as guttural croaking. This may not work too well in the current approach to media access or, or according to Moore's guidelines, as the second sound has been different and could have been described with a different label, providing viewers with hearing loss with sound information that hearing viewers have. Instead, an engagement-based approach may encourage students, for example here, to decide that in this case the priority for the viewer's experience is to actually identify that the sound comes from alien, from the alien, which instead of a label, alien, between brackets, may be here done more subtly by repeating a sound description, guttural croaking, that now is acting as a character identifier, as opposed to as a description of a sound. In the following film, the subtitler accurately describes the sounds made by the protagonist from the perspective of the hearing person. However, if we ask students to take responsibility for the artistic contribution that they're making to the film with their subtitles, we may warn them that by repeating the same adjective, the film is becoming repetitive and monotonous. Whereas perhaps other languages spoken by the film, for example, the way in which it's been edited, are uh, not repetitive. Our sound descriptions are repetitive, which may cause some viewers to have a more monotonous experience when watching the film. Since we are creating language, a language of sounds here, that is part of a film's language, shouldn't we be coordinated with audio describers to ensure that the language used in the description of sounds is consistent with the language used in the description of images, for example? And both of them, in turn, shouldn't they be consistent with the film, with the language used in the film, with the style of a film? Our impact on the reception of the film is probably no less significant than that of the work made by, say, color correctors. Yet, when they are trained, color correctors learn every aspect of filmmaking from beginning to end. Our students may have an initial module dealing with film, but this is normally an introduction and is not remembered or reminded constantly when we are teaching subtitling. And this is linked to the issue of creativity. We often complain that translators' jobs are not well paid, that we are isolated from the production process, and that the creativity of what we do is not valued. But by adopting an approach that is mostly focusing on guidelines rather than on creative alternatives, we're giving ammunition to those who think that our job is about implementing rules rather than applying creative solutions. There are normally no strict guidelines for filmmaking, editing or color correction, but rather some basic rules and then recommendations that can or cannot be relevant for every specific, specific film. We may need guidelines for subtitling, that's fine, but as well as teaching these guidelines, we could also focus on creative alternatives and solutions, which at the moment are being seen as exceptions. Recent engagement uh, with filmmakers and their contribution to access has presented us with many ideas that uh, we had never considered before, such as these two. Um, in the film called Tiempo de Blues, it's Time for Blues, by Miguel Ángel Font, um, well, 
he actually used um, Dev Consultants working with the director of photography. So Dev Consultants focus on image in this case. Blind Consultants working with the sound editor, therefore led by and focused on sound. Um, he also had an accessibility report um, that was informing the strategy used for access. Um, and then that was very interesting that he asked one of the main characters to wear a key ring. Um, blind viewers, because of this, no longer needed uh, the audio description to explain that the character... This meant that blind viewers no longer needed the audio description to explain that this character was coming in or out of a scene because this could already be heard. Um, and this is something that is likely to go unnoticed by sighted viewers in the same uh, kind of along the same lines um, and in terms of subtitling actors were wearing props that had the same color as their subtitles which was also very useful for deaf viewers to identify the different characters and was something that was probably not noticed by most um, hearing and sighted viewers for the film Resonancia, director um, Chimena Kiroth Peters used balloons in the sound studio to ascertain what sounds could be felt by viewers who are profoundly deaf. Those sounds that could be felt by them were not described in the subtitles, which means that it allowed viewers to see the image and also to feel the sound. This is one more example of how, whereas the current approach only attempts to make up for the loss of one sense, the new approach based on engagement, tries to facilitate engagement through a multi-sensory experience. At the end of the day, comprehension is not all that matters when watching a film. And in this picture, we can see how many viewers had a balloon in the cinema and they could feel the sounds uh, that they couldn't hear. Um, finally, taking up the distinction between the medical model of disability and the social model of disability, we could argue that the current approach to media access, as explained by Deborah Fells and, and, uh, and Udo in 2010, has echoes of a medical model in that it focuses first of all on the impairment, uh, in this case no access to audio, uh, and on how to solve it by providing audio information, with us, the hearing experts, um, as a reference. Um, whereas we could have maybe the user, the viewing, the viewer with hearing loss as uh, a reference. Um, it could also be argued that the current approach is similar to the social model in that access services act as a ramp for the building, which in this case is the film. However, the problem here is that the current approach, by applying guidelines regardless of the film, it's kind of building the same ramp for every building, whether or not it suits the style of a building, the tone, the new approach, the engagement-based approach that we are proposing here, advocates a more nuanced ramp that takes into account the building. In other words, access that is suited to the film. Finally, an application to life subtitling of this transition between the current comprehension-based approach and the new engagement-based approach may be seen in the subtitles currently provided for hockey programs in Canada. The governmental regulator is funding currently funding a project to consider changes to the way in which play-by-play -play commentary is being subtitled in programs such as live hockey. As can be seen in this picture, this normally entails very fast speech and therefore very fast subtitles that simply describe what is being seen on the screen. Player X passes the buck to player Y and here we have another example. The shot is blocked by whoever. Now these subtitles are describing what's being seen on the screen and they're actually being displayed on the screen with some delay with regard to the images. Now. The reason for doing this is that the subtitles should include what the hearing person gets. However, Canadian viewers are complaining that by reading these subtitles, they're not able to see the images. So this is an extreme case of the impairment-driven approach to media access because it cancels the viewer's abilities by 
by tackling the viewer's impairment, by focusing on, on the viewer's impairment, providing them with what the viewers who can hear actually get. We force them to read faster than they can read, and we disable their ability to see. So our viewers are still deaf, no matter how much audio info we convey to them, but now we turn them into blind viewers, if you like. To conclude, um, the current approach that is based on comprehension and focus on impairment is working and it has worked for a number of years. It is very efficient and many viewers are very happy with it. Um, but whereas in this current approach, subtitles are trained to apply guidelines in order to compensate for loss by providing the missing content so that viewers can understand the film or a program in the new engagement-based approach, subtitlers are encouraged to look for solutions based on guidelines or on creative strategies to facilitate the viewer's engagement with the film or with the program. And this will often be based on appealing to several senses and on making the most of the user's abilities. The new approach that we are proposing here is more easily applied when the accessible filmmaking model is used but, this is very important, it can also be applied when there is no contact with the filmmakers. So accessible filmmaking is um, desirable um, if, if one would like to apl apply this engagement-based approach, but it's not a requirement. This approach can still be applied without accessible filmmaking. All it takes, really, is uh, a different perspective, a different way to look at access. Thank you very much. This concludes the uh, last unit for module 1A. We hope you have enjoyed it. We hope you found it useful. And um, we hope that you also find useful the rest of the materials that we have prepared for the other modules in this ILSA project. Thank you very much.